So yeah, my name is Angelina. You can find me online as Nine Troubles, and I'm the founder, CEO, and creative director of RD Land. And RD Land is one and only WebXR multiverse for radical self-expression in Web3. And uh, today we're going to talk not only about our exciting multiverse, but also why we created it, and who are the people that are essentially our community, and who are indeed for places like RD Land. And we're super happy to have Saleil today with us because she is actually one of our ambassadors, which is the representative of the communities for whom we are building this amazing land. So let's give her some applause. Woo! More sex in the metaverse. <laughs> awesome. So before we dive into uh, the actual metaverse, I want to talk a little bit more about the demand. The demand for relationships in the virtual spaces. And in particular, we're going to focus on underrepresented communities and understand what are the challenges that these communities are facing and why do I need safe spaces like that. You go, sir? It's all about the angle, right? <laughs> Deeper. Get it right. Get it right. Hey. Okay. <laughs> well, till the end. <laughs> make sure that everyone is on the same boat and understands who are the underrepresented communities. And uh, in particular, we're talking about, you know, a big wide range of communities who have historically been marginalized and oppressed by uh, stereotypical mainstream structures and systems. And these people relate to LGBTQ individuals, BIPOC, women in male-dominated fields, sex workers, uh, people with particular disabilities, this list can go on and on. But uh, there are some things that I will unite in them, uh, and those things are actually the challenges. And challenges that these people are experiencing when they're building social relationships. So, um, actually, I want to have this part a little bit more interactive. And uh, I want to cover some of the pain points of underrepresented communities when it comes to building relationships in online and offline worlds. So uh, let's have a small uh, conversation when we sure. talk about uh, each particular pain point. Uh, and uh, from the eyes of a uh, community and from, in particular from the adult worker creator economy, uh, it would be great to hear more uh about all these pain points from your experience or maybe from experience of people that you had uh, pleasure uh, to work with so discrimination is a really big thing and uh, a lot of people from underrepresented communities are facing these challenges uh, so Saleo, uh, as somebody who works with adult creators can you tell about some discrimination issues that you have experienced yeah i think one of the most um kind of unknown facts about sex workers is they're one of the most oppressed populations in the world. And it is an identity trait. It's beyond just a job. And they experience oppression when it comes to discrimination, when it comes to paper processing, when it comes to race and gender and ability. And it's one of the few jobs that folks like um, a trans person of color with disability has a lot of opportunity in the sex work world to do really well. But then they're facing fetishization and further discrimination. And they go to the job because of discrimination. So it's this interesting, like, how do you choose the amount of oppression you can survive with? <laughs> and how do you choose the place that's going to <laughs> oppress you the least? And the metaverse is a place we can start building that. Yeah, that, that's that's so common. And uh, to be honest, it's just crazy to see how people have to escape the physical reality and enter the virtual simply because they're not being accepted for who they are because of some you know preconceived stereotypes and the ideas that you know, the, the mass media has. And that leads us to the next one, which is the prejudice. Um, Soleil, have you experienced any uh, prejudice in your work? Most of what I say, I work with uh, clients as a sex therapist as well as a sex worker, so I see kind of the intersection of folks who are coming to um, the metaverse to manage issues of prejudice. So I think it really is this, um, I am uh, a white person, so I acknowledge my privilege and my access to spaces that are not always available others, but uh, there is this uh, prejudice experience when it comes to anything sexuality related. Um, the access to expression and pleasure and play and to be yourself is more limited for folks who have intersectionally marginalized identities. And how do you see the virtual spaces uh, affect us? It's the one kind of unifying force, right? In the metaverse, 
We can both be, we both like tentacle shit. There's a hint. Uh, you can be tentacle monsters and, you know, fuck and play and connect with anybody we want to. And your identities are, in some ways, still important and integrated, but you can choose how you relate to them and how they're experienced by the people around you. Um, and you can find your own pathway to expression and community and connection that is, in some ways, agnostic to other identities. So let's move on to the next one, which is the inequality. And uh, again, you know, this inequality we experience uh, as, you know, uh, individuals who relate to underrepresented communities in so many different ways, right? And it goes all the way to, you know, even basic things like healthcare, education, job opportunities, and all the way to being simply able to express yourself, to be who you want to be. And uh, in virtual spaces, we have that opportunity to create any type of reality and become anyone we want to be without, you know, having that uh, preconceived background of what actually it is that, you know, people define us in a physical space. Um, all right, let's uh, go to the main one, which is the censorship. And um, to be honest, that's been the driving factor for uh, many people who are joining our community because uh, censorship you experience not only in the physical space, but uh, primarily in all virtual spaces these days even. Uh, you know, if you look at web to platforms like Meta, uh, obviously everything that is owned by them, but also now even all fans, you know, start in that direction. Uh, people are being silenced. People are not allowed to express themselves, to show their beliefs, their views, their standpoints. And uh, therefore, a lot of amazing creators, artists, speakers, innovative thinkers, they just never even get to even get close to the surface to be seen and to be noticed by the majority of people who would also be able to, re to, re to resonate with their views. Can I ask a question for the group? How many of you know a porn star or an adult creator or someone who makes sexy content on the internet by name? I think there's a space, right, that like, but they're still really hard to find those who, in, in, in more accessible spaces, we're banned on, inter on, on, on Instagram, we're banned on uh, Facebook, we're banned on every social media site you can access. Even in the metaverse, we're banned consistently in crypto spaces and metaverse spaces that have these uh, terms of use that still ban sex. <laughs> You're like, how are we building Web3 with a uh, decentralized community but don't have access to sex communities still? Yeah, that's crazy because, you know, even if we look at the evolution of technology generally, sex work and adult creators have always been on the forefront. Like Tinder, how many people have Tinder on their phone here? Lift your hand. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone has Tinder these days, right? My mom has it even, but like, where it all started? It started because sex workers were using you to make arrangements back and back early in the days. Early, you know, web chats. What have they been used for? For sexting. And just any technology has always been driven by some form of, you know, adult work. It actually, the telegraph, the first technological tool that was used for telecommunication was actually the love child. I don't know if you guys know the story of it. But basically, the guy who created uh, the Telegraph, he had his like dying wife, and he wanted to like send her message in a Morse code, but he was not able to because uh, obviously, I mean, he developed it later. But basically, she was ill, and she like, he couldn't communicate to her, so she passed away. And when he returned, he was like so upset because he couldn't talk to her at the time when she was getting sick and died. So he invented the Telegraph so that people would be able to send messages over the distance in a short amount of time. And the first message that he wrote was actually a love letter. So anyway, uh, let's continue. So, but, uh, you know, before we talk about what can we do about all these pain points and how we can solve them, let's just talk about, you know, general significance of social relationships. Because even if we don't talk about underrepresented communities, talk about sex workers, just talk about us, right? Like, we are social animals. We are here because we like to belong. We like to have our tribe. You know, we need each other for acceptance, for a sense of trust, for support. You know, despite how good, I, how, how much hermit you are, like, or antisocial social person, like I like to call myself, eventually we all come together, right? Because that's in our nature. And uh, it's really important to understand what problems people who are not part of the, you know, that 1% of highly privileged societies are and be able to help them. So they get that level of support that is needed to maintain our general wellness and uh, be able to grow personally and professionally in all dimensions. 
and I feel like they would love to know what you've made. I really love the thing that that Angelina's built, and it might be nice to just like do you want me to give you some props, or do you want to talk about it? Well, we'll, we'll okay, we'll go. we're getting. I feel like there's like this closer. big lead up to be like she made a cool thing, and it needs to grow, and we want to support. It. <laughs> we're coming to it. Okay, so uh, we're actually we're super close because now okay. we're talking about virtual relationships as a solution. Yes. <laughs> so uh, obviously, you know, COVID played a big role in um, developing our relationships online. Um, even though all that already been existed, but you know, it's still considered to be a bit nerdy you know, to have some virtual sex with somebody or do some stuff online. It was still considered to be something that minorities engage in. But then, you know, when we all got locked at home, that was really the only solution. And uh, actually, now we can use these virtual technologies to be able to not only like replace long distance relationships, but also to extend and expand what we can do in physical reality on a day to day basis. But even being able to be here and simultaneously somewhere else and have this mixed reality, you know, intimate experience with your partner, that's like a next level type of shift. Which is already happening, right? But you know, we just need to be open to it. And I'm super happy now we're getting to that place in our consciousness where we can allow and accept those things to happen. So, uh, yes, impact. So what impact do all these amazing things have on us as a general society, but also on underrepresented communities? And actually, before we go there, that's uh, a render of our avatars from RD Land. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about why they look the way they look, because we are redefining the whole idea of human embodiment in a metaverse. Because, you know, metaverse, we don't have to have two legs, two arms, so male, female, who cares, right? It can be anything. So, but we'll talk more about that. Um, yes. So, impact, safety, obviously. Uh, in virtual space, you don't have any threat to be somehow physically harassed. Obviously, you know, things can happen and we can talk more about the different types of harassment that can happen online because that opens like a whole range of new issues. But if we talk about basic things, it can provide us with safety because we are in control of what's happening to a certain extent, right? If you are, for example, let's say you, you've been a, a victim of rape, right? And you're going into the virtual uh, sensual experience with somebody and you're starting to build up your courage and confidence. If something goes wrong, you can always pull out the plug, right? You can control what's happening and you have that safety to be able to control your experience. Uh, so, Leo, from the eyes of community, uh, how much safety do you find working with people online versus offline? Unfortunately, abusive behavior happens everywhere, um, but I think there is, you know, a space to choose how we engage in it, and, and there is more tools when it comes to a digital space. Um, but also, humans need to do better and not harass each other. <laughs> so I think there's kind of a like we should keep doing better, and also it's nice that we have more tools and more resources to. Yeah, I can be in a conversation with somebody, and the minute they say something that's sexist, I can be like goodbye, <laughs> and there's no awkward. I can just, you know, depending on the platform, I can move them, I can leave, I can. Um, make choices around that, which really does improve that relationship to safety. Excellent. So then the other really big one for the virtual spaces is anonymity. So uh, amazing example, which I love bring to everyone. So before we decided to build RD Land, actually we've been using other platforms uh, to start building community and you know just trying out this whole concept and see you know if people actually gonna have a demand and need for such spaces. And uh, at the time, we were still using Altspace VR, rest in peace, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, and uh, we had these um, events called Uncensored Chats. And uh, in these chats, basically, people would just get together in a safe virtual space and just talk about like the boot subject. And every two weeks, we would have a different angle and always was related to sexuality or sexuality. And that topic was, uh, was about LGBTQ communities. And uh, basically, we had um, this guy. He was like maybe around was like late 50, something around 56 or 58. He uh, joined the virtual experience from the Middle Asia. I can't remember where, but was some like Muslim country. And uh, for the first time, just think about it: 56 men married, two children. He confessed for the first time in his entire life to this group of random strangers who he will never meet again, who he doesn't know how they look like, who they are, that he was homosexual and he'd been living with that crest his entire fucking life. Can you imagine? 
married, two children, never ever been able to open up. That's insane. Just think about it. And those random strangers provided him enough safety to be able to talk about it. So, you know, often seeing that and understanding, you know, how much of like impact and value we brought that man's life, I was like, yo, we are up to something here. You know, we have to expand and create something much larger from it. So uh, that's just a great example of how uh, anonymity can actually help uh, people who do struggle with social re relationships in the virtual spaces. Well, I think one comment too is for folks who it's hard to find community in, if you have a lot of marginalized identities or you're pretty fucking fringe, you're in the fetish shit, you're, the more and more fringe you get in your arousal, your desire, your expression, the harder it is to find your people, especially on you know dating apps where you can't really be super explicit about that stuff sometimes. So. It, this is a space where you literally can be any kind of expression and you can find safe, healthy expression and access to it. I find this a lot actually with like clients of mine who struggle with like uh, more taboo fetishes that they will never tell a person in real life. And they can, you know, go in and express uh, a client that I do. I sometimes see clients in the metaverse and I'll do like mommy role play fetish with him and he will never say that to a partner. But like we have these really beautiful like nurturing and like in a mommy avatar and we I hold him and we talk about his emotional needs and it's this like access to a thing you can't get in real life in a way in the same way that you could ever be safe in the metaverse. It's so great. Yeah, exactly. So that leads us to the access to neglected perspectives. And that also reflects on the idea of censorship that we uh, touched upon earlier, because in the safe virtual spaces, people are able to open up and express themselves and share their perspectives in a judgment-free environment. That's exactly what people cannot do in the mainstream, commercially owned platforms, because if your views, if your content doesn't meet with what considered to be appropriate by the community, Community guidelines, it doesn't have a place to exist. But in the places like RD Land and any other safe uh, space for underrepresented communities, people are able to express themselves and be able to talk about anything that they uh, want to share. When I see too with gender, it's a great place where there's a lot of gender fucking happening, where like trans folks can come and be their first embodiment in a different space. Um, I don't know, have any of you all watched VR porn before? Anybody watch VR porn? VR porn? Or watch VR? Um, I fucking love to watch VR porn and pretend I have a dick sometimes. It's just, most of it's POV, so you're like, you're watching it and the person has a penis. And so I'm watching it and I'm like, this is really weird. But like, and so for someone who's actually going through an experience of like, what is my gender? What is my identity? Things like VR porn, things like VR communities, give them a space to practice, like being an expression in a way they can't find any other place. Yeah. And that also leads to access to resources. So they can find support, find networks where they can get that level of acceptance and, uh, and sense of belonging in the end. Because, you know, um, to bring back that example of uncensored chat, right? Like the purpose of those events were for people to come together and understand that they're not, you know, that one crazy freak on the world, that they're every almost like a person experiencing somewhat similar type of experience, maybe slightly different, but the core of it is very, very similar. And the more we talk about it, the more, you know, we share, the more we're able to, you know, support and understand each other in the end of the day. So, um, okay, let's maybe jump to convenience, uh, because it's kind of self-explanatory, you know, so we can access spaces in any time and any place. And that is why also our land is built on the web. So all you need is internet and some form of smart device. Uh, but yeah, wider audience, which is also super amazing and uh, important uh, factor because you know, Providing you know, opportunities for self-expression uh, has to come with the reach to the wider audience because that's the whole point, to bring to the surface those who've been struggling to get themselves seen and heard. Oh, okay, the empowerment. Okay, that's the best one. So actually, instead of me uh, talking about it, Celine, so do you want to share more about how uh, the metaverse and virtual spaces help sex workers with empowerment? Yeah, I mean, I think the metaverse is still trying. I think you're the... You're, how I found our dealing actually was by like searching the internet, like who in the metaverse is doing sex stuff? Okay. Uh, but like there's there's not a whole lot happening, but there's a lot of space for potential. And a lot of, for those of you who do crypto stuff in the room, so many of the crypto projects that are sex related will fail, have failed in the past because they're not involving sex workers in the community and in the, in the infrastructure to build a thing that actually involves the people it's <laughs> engaging with, which is true of any marginalized community. You need the voices of the people that it's serving and engaging with, but it has the potential to be a place where Currently, sex workers don't own any of their content. Nothing on the internet is owned by the performer, even OnlyFans. They don't own it. OnlyFans can take their shit down any day they feel like. 
Blockchain is the only place we could actually imagine owning our own content. In the metaverse, a place we could actually imagine owning our own relationship to marketing, to our clients, to access to networking, to belonging to other sex workers. Um, and ideally, you know, we have our own sex work DAO where we can build this community of belonging. And Ardealand is really trying to start that, and it's great. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so, and uh, speaking of Ardealand, so, you know, that was the reason why we decided to build space like Ardealand. So, because, you know, we felt the need that there is a huge demand and it's not being fulfilled by anyone. And luckily, giants like Meta will never go into that space because that's something they're actively trying to, you know, to hide and put under the rug and pretend that nobody was ever fucking and, you know, Mark came out of, I don't know, like Golden Egg or something. So, um, Ardealand is basically the inclusive multiverse for radical self-expression where everyone can do whatever they want to do. They can express themselves the way they like. It's a safe and playful space for meaningful and long-lasting connections. So, um, or the like short version, a place to do sex stuff with people in a consensual, safe, and playful way where you're not going to get censored. <laughs> exactly. So here are some of the uh, review uh, elements from Ardealand. I also brought VR headset, so uh, everyone who is interested in experiencing parts of it, uh, there is an opportunity to do so. Uh, we have to wrap up. I mean, it's all okay. All right. Well, I, I can talk about this forever. <laughs> all right. So uh, quickly, quickly, very briefly. Um, so obviously, you know, the concept is great, and our community is there. But how, as the creator, you can monetize your creativity and your work? So. Uh, basically, our creators can take home 97.5% uh, of their earnings compared to OnlyFans. How much you can take on OnlyFans? 16, maybe. Oh, if there's campsites like it. and other sites content, it's maybe 30%. Exactly. So, uh, we've built our economy with creator in heart and mind because yeah, I come from the creator background and we work with creators like Soleil and others. So, we basically have an empty marketplace where they're able to trade their assets. We have an amazing thing, which is uh, gated fat rooms, which is one of my favorite part of our events, like I talk about in a moment. And obviously, you can also do events uh, for your community and inside your gated fat rooms. And getting fat room is actually a pretty simple concept. So, if you think about OnlyFans, but take that and add it to the metaverse, right? So as a creator, you can have your own world, you can have your own room that you design what you like, you put content that you want to have in there, right? Those could be the same NFTs that you that sell in the marketplace or not. It could be online, uh, in real time type of content, could be performance, whatever you like as a creator, right? And then you might like access that room. Yeah, it's either you know NFT gated or somebody would pay a subscription fee that you decide uh, obviously in crypto. So that's an amazing way for creators to engage with their audience because instead of somebody clicking on a wide black page on a single web, they're actually stepping inside the world, inside the mind of the creator to be able to experience all sides of it and uh, be able to engage with them in real time. Okay, I, I can see that I have to wrap up. <laughs> okay, so um, do we have a two moments for QA? Yeah, all right. Well, I gotta stop talking and let's do a few QAs and then you gotta find the answer and we can fit. <laughs> Thank you. Questions from anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty, pretty so one thing is uh, my girlfriend. <laughs> On uh, this creator from the creator's perspective, uh, can I theoretically prostitute with myself? On the platform, like you want to have sex with a dragon, I take an avatar of a dragon and I do whatever. And we have sex on the virtual reality. Or yeah. Then... yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Okay. Next. <laughs> <laughs> well, not girlfriends. We won't tell. And we're still working on the ideally body tracking and all the other things you can integrate long term, but right now it's still an option. Sure. So my question would be like, how do you manage not to lose your identity, like as a physical person, into getting involved in this kind of metaverse as well? Good question. Um, what do you define as a physical identity? I don't think we are already, you know, still in the place where we can, you know, solely have a separation between, you know, virtual physical identities. 
you know, uh, I think you know, that was a relevant thing, you know, when the internet was getting started. But right now, you know, the internet became such a, you know, integral part of our existence, you know, the way how we use social media, you know, how we portray ourselves on different platforms, that it's, it's part of who we are already, right? And the uh, metaverse is essentially extension of the regular, you know, internet. Because in this case, you know, you still open the same website, but in this, in this instance, you're able to walk into it literally and uh, step inside a 3D virtual world. So, in a way, um, you know, I don't see that as a separate identity. I see that as extension, you know, as an opportunity to play, right, with the versions of us. Because think about it, right? Like the way you act with your boyfriend and the way you act with your, I don't know, like coworker would be very different, right? Like you would still turn different sides of you and people would always, you know, describe you in a different way when they would see you and talk about you in different uh, social settings. So same in a, in a virtual space, right? Like it just gives us more options, you know, where we can step out of the environment and become something crazy, something that can only exist in a virtual space. And that's what I keep on telling everyone that, you know, why we try to recreate the physical world in a virtual? Because there, you know, we have this infinite landscape of infinite possibilities to become anything we want to be. And uh, why do we want to be humans again? We, we already are humans, you know, we have this reality that we can enjoy, right? It's like legs, arms, air, everything. In a virtual space, like, you, you can go crazy, right? You can become like some weird octopus uh, streamer, like my avatar, for example. <laughs> but, but you should still deal with your emotional shit. So like, you should still be addressing, like, you're feeling really distanced, you can't be yourself, you don't feel comfortable, like, you can do that work in the metaverse too. So it's like, how do you use your new integrations to heal these parts of you and express them too? Yeah, I have a question in the engagement, like, towards, you know, like, as a creator with the clients, like, you know, how, how does that work? How does the, you know, like, connection, I don't Obviously, you can manage who can access to your content, right? So you can choose if it's something that is open to everyone, to the public, or, you know, it's private. If it's private, you know, you can decide who could be the people that are getting access to whitelist, right? For example, if it's NFT dated, then, you know, uh, people would have, may have to enter some whitelist before they get into whitelist. Yeah, so you can manage the access if you choose to. Um, then obviously, you know, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But then in terms of like interactions uh, in real time, right, that happen in the platform. So we're working on solutions that also can, uh, you know, protect people from, you know, some weirdos and some, you know, harassment and all that. So one of the great things, um, obviously, you know, you can find people, you can report people. Um, so we can report content as well. Um, when it comes to the content uh, in the public spaces, we're, uh, we're pretty open, but we still have, you know, some regulations. So uh, everything that can be considered as like soft core can be uh, uh, posted in the public spaces. Everything that goes in a work stream has to be in a private space managed by the creator. And uh, when it comes to human-to-human -human interactions, so we have this amazing thing which is like a protective bubble. It's not currently available in limited beta, but it's going to be available for the version one. So basically, you know, whenever you feel like you know somebody's getting too close to you, you can turn on the bubble. So these people will never be able to enter the particular range uh, of distance uh, next to your avatar. Yeah, and you, you can do that selectively. So somebody's like annoying you, you're like, hey. <laughs> you're blessed. Guys, we're about to end now, so we're, we're going to transition. But um, we are, and it is in the development phase. So if you have, if you know funders and you have people that want to contribute or you want to contribute, uh, Ardealand's in a great place of growth and progress. 
Yes, definitely. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, yes, we like said we are growing, and uh, we are currently very close to finishing our uh, version number one. And we're looking for more people interested in joining us as creators, but also as investors. So uh, check it out. Yes, check it out. And I gotta. I have. I'm gonna mail it to cards that I can give you all. But yeah, I have to leave right now. So <laughs> thank you. We'll be back there with it. Thank you guys. Round of applause. They're gonna have the VR set up over the back there. So. You want to go and say g'day, you can. G'day, I'm so Australian. You can say hello. You can say hola. <laughs>